Mark Lamont Hill, pleasure to have you. Good to be here. Absolutely. We've been working on this for, what, maybe six months, nine months or so? <laughs> yeah, a lot going on, man, you know, getting schedules together, but I'm glad to finally uh, sit down and do it. Absolutely. You have a new book out. Yeah, man, I'm excited about it. Uh, it's called Nobody, uh, Casualties of America's War on the Vulnerable, from Ferguson to Flint and beyond, man. I've been, I worked on it for a long time, and I'm just really glad to get it out. Okay, now why'd you call it Nobody? You know, I got to Ferguson uh, the day after Mike Brown was killed, and I was uh, looking around, and I saw a town that was really still stunned by the shooting, stunned by the death, watching that boy lay out there for four and a half hours. It was like a lynching. Uh, back in the 19th, 20th century, you'd have lynchings, and the whole town would watch the, the state execute somebody. It wasn't just about killing the person. It was about making sure that everybody saw what happens when you challenge authority. And they talked about what it meant to watch him lay out there, you know, his blood going through the concrete. You could smell death in the air. No medical establishment. No police came out there. They put a sheet over his body. Didn't even fit his body. He laid out there for four and a half hours. And one girl said to me, they left him out there like he ain't belong to nobody. And that stuck with me, that, like he ain't belong to nobody. And when I thought about Mike Brown's life, I realized that that nobodiness wasn't just about the police leaving him out there. It was also about the... Uh, the school district that failed him, Normandy School District. It was about the job market that had left when Emerson Electric left. It was about the public housing that never worked out in St. Louis and with Pru- Pruitt Igo and all around the, the state. And then I kept trying to tell the story of Mike Brown. And right when, as I was writing a book proposal for that, we heard about Eric Garner and, and his killer not being uh, indicted. We, we saw uh, Freddie Gray die in Baltimore. We saw Sandra Bland die in Hempstead, Texas. We saw Walter Scott get shot in his back running away in Charleston. And after case after case after case, I kept seeing two things that were similar. A bunch of people that were treated like nobody and a bunch of, in, bunch of institutions that had abandoned them like nobody long before they got killed by the state. Yeah. I mean, when you see what's been happening, when you see, you know, and the comparison that a lot of people try to make is like, well, what about black on black crime? But when you look at black on black crime, the person doing it usually goes to prison. <laughs> whereas, yeah. whereas when you look at police on black crime, almost always the police officers walk away. That's exactly right. There's no shortage of black people in jail for killing black people. Uh, right. and, and at the very least, they get investigated, they get charged, there's an arrest, there's a grand jury indictment, there's all this stuff that doesn't happen, as you said, pointed out, when b- police kill us. The other thing is, with black on black crime, which is itself a, a funny term, right, a, a curious term, I mean, it's not about black on black, it's about proximity. It's, when people typically get, get killed by people who live in their neighborhoods. People don't go across town to murder people. people. White people get killed by white people. Asians get killed by Asians. That's just the norm. But we don't talk about white on white crime because we don't pathologize what white people do. White people do poorly on tests compared to Asians. But we don't say there's an Asian achievement gap, a white Asian achievement gap, right? We only talk about it when it comes to black folk. But even within that, you know, we do try to prevent black on black crime, quote unquote. We don't protest, we don't march for it, and people say, why aren't you out there marching against that? Well, because that's not how you stop black-on-black crime. You stop it by getting people jobs. You stop it by violence interruption. You stop it by mentoring people. You stop it through early education. You stop it through arts programs, music programs, sports programs. And that's the work we've been trying to do. And with police, we have a different expectation. I don't have an expectation that the Crips or the GDs or the Vice Lords or the Bloods are going to protect me. I, I didn't sign a contract with them. I don't pay taxes to the Bloods for them to take care of me. Now, I, I pay taxes to the police to take care of me, to protect me, to make sure that at least that they don't kill me. So I have a heightened expectation from them. The social contract says the police are supposed to protect and serve. We know historically they never have, but that's always been the goal. That's not my arrangement with Bloods and Crips. That's not my arrangement with, with people up the block shooting at each other. So it's a different expectation from the state. And I don't want anybody to kill me with impunity. And that's what the police are doing. They're killing us with impunity. They're killing us and nothing's being done about it. Well, let's talk about that for a second because when you look at the conviction rates of when cops kill people, and I'm not exactly sure what they are, but based on what you see over and over again, it almost seems like, you know, single digits. It you is know, single digits. Five, digit. five, ten percent. So when you have that type of odds, you know what I'm saying? Just, just look at, like, for example, a, a Vegas odds. You know, <laughs> you're going to go to where the odds are higher. So if you know as a police officer you could kill someone and nothing's going to happen, you're going to be much less likely to think twice about committing these types of things. So what do you think is sort of the, the overall implication of, of that type of behavior? Right. And th- that type of, um, you know, just situation, when, when it happens, like, they walk away from it. It's not even a slap on the wrist. It's not even a year in jail, five years in jail, and so forth. Usually they get the jobs back, they get back pay, and so forth. 
Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. The first thing is we, we do have to acknowledge that all police killings or police involved shootings and killings are not um, the police in the wrong based on the law, right? In other words, sometimes they are defending themselves. Sometimes people are trying to kill them. So, so part of why the number is low is because some of them are quote unquote legit. And we could talk about what legit means. That's a deeper question, conversation as well. But that's part of the, the, the issue as well. Um, and another thing that's interesting is that in the last year or two, we've seen more convictions because there's more surveillance, there's more camera phones, there's more people witnessing it and having their witness trusted more. Um, even when black people get beaten, shot and killed on tape, it doesn't mean there's going to be a conviction, but it does increase the odds when that happens. And that's one of the things we're beginning to see. Um, I'm not convinced also that police necessarily have those odds in their head when they shoot people. I think it's even more messy and complicated than that. Um, even if more people went to jail for it, because remember, sometimes these cops have body cameras on and they're still killing them. The problem is that police operate from the same frameworks that we all do. We all have scripts in our minds of who and what people are. And unfortunately, one of our social scripts for black people is violence. So when you see Mike Brown walking down the street, you see violence, and if you're certain people. If, you're, if you see Trayvon Martin with nothing but Skittles and a hoodie, you still see violence. So if, I don't doubt, to be honest, that, that George Zimmerman thought Trayvon was guilty of something. And I don't doubt that he uh, thought that Trayvon was gonna hurt him. I don't doubt that. The problem is there was no reason to believe it. There was no rational basis for that. And then they go to court, and then there's a jury of his or her peers, and they're asked to invoke what we call the reasonable man or the reasonable person standard, which is what would a reasonable person do under these circumstances? So now you got 12 jurors who are sitting there saying, well, what would I do if I saw Trayvon? What would I do if I saw Mike Brown? And unfortunately, many of them would do the same thing. So now not only do we have a, a police officer who made a, a, a snap judgment that was underwritten by racism, but you have a jury that makes the same decision and doubles down on it. And you have a law that makes it all legal. So we have literally codified, we have made it legal, we have normalized white supremacist fear of black bodies. So the problem isn't just a bad cop, the problem isn't just uh, needing more cameras, the problem is the entire system is designed in such a way that it can't do anything but yield injustice to us. That's why we don't say anymore, I encourage people not to say that the system is broken because that implies that we can tweak it, that we can reform it, that we can make it something other than it is. No, this, we need to stop saying that the system is broken and we need to make it work. We have to start saying the system is working and we need to break it. Well, you said in a, in a previous interview that you want to live in a society with no police at all. Yeah, that, that would be the ideal world for me. Okay, I mean, a, a lot of people raise their eyebrows when you said that. I mean, explain how that's even possible. Well, you don't begin there, right? You don't begin with the world without cops. Like, I'm not saying let's go to the worst neighborhoods in the city to all the cops to roll out and we live happily ever after. I'm, I'm talking about a, a bigger social imagination, a, a broader, more ambitious freedom dream than that. I'm saying we have to start with imagining a world without police and start by imagining a world without prisons and start by imagining a world where we invest and see people as sites of investment in love rather than containment and blame. If we begin from there, then we begin to do the things necessary. So before I have a world without cops, I need a world where uh, we invest in things that make people less likely to commit crime. Food, clothing, shelter, early literacy, head start, uh, getting lead out of the environment, getting uh, carbon emissions out of the environment. I'm just thinking of places like Flint, Michigan right now in case people think I'm tripping. Like we got rid of lead in the 70s. Nah, not in Flint, not in Cleveland, not in Baltimore, not in, not in Pennsylvania. So creating environmental standards that are safer, creating educational options that are better, creating uh, resources for people who are on the wrong side of, of, of American social life. For example, people who are drug addicted, treating that as a medical problem rather than a criminal problem. Because quite frankly, when white people get addicted to crystal meth or when their kids end up strung out on heroin, America suddenly says, oh my God, we need to treat these people instead of throwing them in a cage. But they didn't do that with black folk. We need that for everybody. So if we invest in these things, that creates a different type of environment, and then we don't need the prison in the same way. I'm not saying that nothing, but one more thing, I'm not saying ain't nothing bad will happen. I'm not saying that we don't need to address things, but we can have an entirely different social arrangement in the long term whereby we police our own communities, whereby we have a different relationship to our own community and to justice, so that we don't have an occupying force from the outside coming in, but instead we police ourselves from the inside. I mean, right, because I interview a lot of, a lot of rappers. Like, for example, I just interviewed Lil Bibby. Yeah. And he, he told me with a straight face, you mean to tell me 
that if I walked up to your mother right in front of you and shot her in the face, yeah. and then I, I left the country and you could never, you can't get to me, you Hell wouldn't no. tell the police. Hell no, I'm, I'm a, I'm, where your mama stay at? <laughs> Is she in the neighborhood? So you kind of see this to a certain regard, but I feel that sort of the fundamentals of it have been kind of twisted up. Right. I mean, that, that, a lot of that comes out of the, the, the logic of no, not snitching, right? And yeah. there's a lot of reasons why people are reluctant to engage the police. Now, I would argue that if there's a rapist in the community and you call the police to stop the rapist, you're not snitching, right? There, there's a distinction between snitching and witnessing. I agree. I don't want anybody to snitch. I believe you should not snitch. Snitching means that if you and I commit a crime together and one of us get caught, you don't go telling. You eat that time. You eat that case. That's what, that's what snitching is about. It's not snitching when someone comes and sets your house on fire and burns up your grandmama, as what happened in Baltimore, and you, you, don't, have to, you don't have to sit on that. There's nothing wrong with you telling somebody, right? That's not snitching. Now, I understand that people don't have a good faith relationship to the police, so they don't trust what's going to happen when they call the police. They don't trust that the person's going to get a fair shake. I mean, if somebody graffitied on my house right now in Philly, I wouldn't call the police. One, because I don't trust the police, and two, because I worry that what they would do to the young man who graffitied on my house would be so far beyond what should happen that it wouldn't be justice either. So there are a lot of reasons why people don't want to engage and trust the police. But what we have to do is think even bigger than that immediate reactionary moment, right? And we have to say, okay, well, if, if there is a serial killer in the community, if there is a rapist in the community, how do we handle it in ways that don't bring more violence to the community, that don't bring more police ultimately to the community, but also get justice? Because it's not just about me not wanting the rapist in the community, it's about making the victim whole again. It's about making the survivor whole again and making, creating a world where the survivor is okay. And that means coming up with new ways of resolving injustice. That means community-based dispute resolution. That means restitution. That means community service. That means uh, paying money back for other, in other ways beyond, and literally giving people their stuff back. Say you steal somebody's TV. These are ways that you can make people whole again that don't involve the prison, that don't involve the jail, and don't involve the criminal justice system as we currently imagine it. That's what I'm talking about. I'm trying to imagine a world without prison. But remember, the person running through the hood raping people or shooting people as a serial killer has a mental health issue. I'm not saying give them a slap on the wrist, say give us the money back and go back home. I'm saying that person needs to probably, probably be some kind of secured mental health confinement. They need to be treated. You can't go around raping people or molesting people or killing people and not have a severe mental health issue. I'm saying let's treat the issue. Let's get justice. Let's make the world whole. But the problem is we have grown into a world where we confuse justice with punishment and punishment with confinement. So we can't imagine justice any other way but putting somebody in a cage. There has to be something bigger than that. Right. I mean, I don't know if you saw the, there's a 60 Minutes special about the German prison system. Did mm. you ever see that? Yeah. And Swedish. There's, there's, there's one in Sweden yeah, too. It, yeah. it, was, it was mind blowing because, you know, they, they talked to the head of the German prison system and his thing was nobody is above rehabilitation. You know, every single prison guard has three years of training and we treat every person like a human being. And they showed the actual prison cells in Germany where you had your own key to the cell. You know, you had a TV. It almost looked like a college dorm room in yeah. a way. You know, you had darts in there, you know, and they didn't even think to use it as a weapon. But when you look at the, the U.S. prison system, it's, it's a night and day difference. I mean, like the, 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 the COs are completely untrained. There's an animosity between the COs and the prisoners. So you kind of establish a certain level that, you know, if you really take a step back, it hasn't really been working. And no, it's not it, it hasn't been. Yeah. Because the, the goal of prison in the United States is very different. Uh, in my book, Nobody, uh, which again is out in stores right now, one of the things I talk about in the fifth chapter of that book is uh, the prison and how it came about. You know, when the prison came about, it really came, it's a, in many ways a very American thing. There were other forms of punishment that were similar, but they were very different than what the Americans came up with. We had this idea, and the Quakers in particular had an idea that prison could be something that could be rehabilitative. We came up with the idea of the penitentiary, and that the root of the word penitentiary is penitence. The idea was that you could pay penitence, that you could give penitence, that you could uh, atone for your sins. And so the Quakers decided that they'd create a space where you'd go to this place and you'd reflect. They gave them a Bible, they gave them a bed, they read, they reflected, and they came out into the world better citizens. The problem is when Eastern State Penitentiary was created and these other penitentiaries were created, they weren't created for black and brown folk. And they weren't connected to the economic logic of America. This was a purely a, a project about making white people whole again. Then suddenly when black folk start going to jail, it's a whole other thing. It's no longer about rehabilitation, it's about exploitation. Remember, the prison begins 
after, uh, after slavery. You know, you had all these people on all these plantations, all these farms who were making money. America is built on the exploitation of black labor. America is built on slave labor. So slavery ends and suddenly the slave codes turn into black codes, right? Because the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, right? But it only abolishes slavery except under the condition of prison. In other words, if you commit a crime, if you're incarcerated, according to the 13th Amendment, slavery is still allowed. So you're technically a slave if you're in prison. Absolutely. You can legally be told what to do. Your labor can be forced, etc. So if, if, no, if, if nobody's a, if you, So think about it like this. You need slaves to keep the economy going. You don't have slaves anymore unless people commit a crime. So what do you do? You make everything a crime. So suddenly mm-hmm. the slave codes became the black codes. So now mm-hmm. black people can be arrested for vagrancy, for standing outside, for cursing in front of a woman, for being out of town without a job. All of these things, which are fairly arbitrary crimes, or if crimes at all, they take them and they throw them back into the prison. And then they have something called the convict lease system, where the prison can lease the convicts out to the same plantations they left to do the same work that they did as slaves. So now the slaves have become free only to become slaves again through prison. And that is a system that we're dealing with right now, a a, a new version of the convict lease system. And that's why labor is exploited. And that's why prisons have become even more for profit. That's why we see more privatization, because people make money money in this country of exploited labor. And this is one example of it. So you grew up in Philly. Yes, sir. And you mentioned in a previous interview that your brother just came home from prison. Yeah. He's been home for a few years now. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, like how long did he go in for? Uh, he was he was in he was in and came home for like a few months and went right back for a few more years. So on and off about about eight years, eight nine years. Okay, so what, what what was the type of stuff that he was doing to get himself back in prison every time? I don't talk about other people's cases. Okay, fair enough. But my question is, how do you have two brothers? One of them has a PhD. The other one is going in and out of prison all the time. You know, a lot of times people. Um, attribute everything to choice, right? Like Mark made the good choices, other dude didn't make good choices, right? And I think that's too simple. One, it romanticizes my narrative. I made bad choices too. I made some bad choices with him. Um, We just didn't get caught, you know? Um, I, in some ways, was lucky. In some ways, I had a set of talents that school could recognize in a different way than his talents. He was just as talented, he was just as smart. Our IQ scores weren't vastly different. He just had a different set of needs. And if you treat everybody the same, even though they're different, that is just as bad as treating people who are different, treating people differently who are the same. Because we tend to live in a country where we like, treat everybody the same, that's the fair thing to do. The problem is everybody ain't the same. So school is cookie cutter, parenting is cookie cutter, neighborhoods are cookie cutter. And so he had a different set of needs than me. And so in some ways, you know, I just got lucky. In some ways, I just had somebody save me at the right time. And in some ways, I just had this teacher versus that teacher. You know what I mean? And like I said, in some days, I just ran left, he ran right. And and so life just went differently for us in certain ways. But he's a great dude, man, and he's brilliant. And, you know, I think and life is going to be just fine for him. He's a great father. He's a he's a strong dude. And I have other brothers and a sister as well. And everybody's finding their own way. Everybody's doing their own thing. But I think the key is to say, yes, we all are responsible for our choices. We all have to make good choices. Um, I didn't always make good choices. My other siblings didn't always make good choices. The key, though, is to create a world where some people's, where nobody's uh, mistakes are over punished while others are under punished, right? Rich white people make the same mistakes as poor black people. The difference is our mistakes are, are so hyper scrutinized that we have no room for error. Well, I mean, here's what's interesting. Uh, I saw a documentary by the guy that created the, the Segway. And um, he, he brought up a very interesting point. He said, if you ask any, any kid in school who LeBron James is, they'll all know who he is. If you talk about who created the cell phone, who, who created, um, you know, who, who created um, the internet, right. you know, who created Wi-Fi and so forth, nobody knows. And yet, you're celebrating a person who puts a ball in a hole with a slightly better percentage than his coworkers. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the the skill level between a LeBron James and any other professional NBA player, 
if you take a step back, it's not really that great. The person who created the internet <laughs> has a very vast level of, um, you know, success in terms of what he's brought to the world. You got a PhD. How many years did you go? You know, did you go to college altogether to get that PhD? I went. I was in school. So I got it pretty fast, but I did college four years, PhD four years. Okay, so eight years total. Yeah. Why do you think, like, especially in the hip hop community, which is what my audience is, PhDs aren't really celebrated, whereas well, professional athletes are. Well, let me be clear. I don't think PhDs are celebrated anywhere. Really? Uh, yeah. So I don't want to, because I don't, I don't want to stigmatize a demon. Really? In the in the Asian community, you don't think PhDs are celebrated? No. Not not any more than anywhere else. No. I I think that there are spaces. That, that's why that's why it's important. It's important to kind of hash that out a little bit and tease that out because. I think, first of all, I think in general as a nation, we love popular culture figures, right? We love, because if I go to the, the Country Music Awards, ain't no PhDs sitting in there. If I go, you know what I mean? If, if I go to, if, if, if I'm checking out the jazz tr community, you know what I mean? You know, maybe because that's in the university, there are a few more PhDs celebrated, but they're not celebrated for the PhD. I think that in general, we live in a country that can be anti-intellectual. I think we live in a celebrity-driven culture and everybody loves celebrities. Everybody loves, people like me because I'm on TV. You know what I mean? If I went on TV and I was saying the same shit, like nobody would be like, yo, that's that guy that be writing those books that nobody reads, right? It's like, that's the guy from VH1, that's the guy from BET, that's the guy from CNN. And that creates space for me to do the other kinds of work. So I don't think it's particular to the hip hop community. Um, I think that, I think though that we do have to create opportunities uh, for our young people to see a wider range of possibility, um, a wider range of opportunity, because it's easier to get a PhD than it is to make the NBA. It's easier to get a PhD than it is to play in the NFL. PhDs are really hard to get, but still easier than being one of the 300 players in the NBA in the whole world. <laughs> right. you, know, you know what I mean? Um, Asian communities, some, some value education, some communities don't, and, and any more than black people, right? I mean, we, we tend to use Asians kind of a broad brush as the kind of model minority, but if you think about Asian in the context of being Cambodian or Hmong, you know what I mean? No one's running around saying, why don't you be like those Cambodians, right? When, when they say Asians, they mean a very particular slice of Asian community, so we have to be very careful about that. But I think the hip-hop community is like everything American. They value celebrity, they value wealth accumulation, they, you know, they, they have a certain set of uh, understandings of the world that aren't different than anybody else. Uh, what I want for hip-hop, obviously, is for us to be better than the world. I want us to be better than what white folk are doing. I want us to be better than what the mainstream is doing. I want us to be a constant threat, a constant challenge to authority. I want us to celebrate the best of us, but also demand more of us. Well, you actually teach a class on Jay-Z and Nas. Yeah. Is that, is that one class or is that two classes? It's one class. I do a Jay-Z Nas class. It started back like in 05 when it was a big deal because they were still, they were just coming out of the, 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 the kind of ether takeover mode. So, okay. you know, we were a few years removed from that at the time. We were four years removed from it when I started the class, so it made sense. Now, for me, I, I still hold them up because they're such shining examples of, of a particular generation of hip-hop. And also, their lives represent so many interesting things beyond hip-hop, whether it's fatherhood or fatherlessness, whether it's ha ha this issue of beef, whether it's parenting, whether it's uh, project life and what it means to, to live in New, in New York public housing, whether it's Queensbridge or Marcy. You know, it's about aging, it's about cosmopolitanism, watching Jay-Z go from, from Hawaiian Sophie to Reasonable Doubt to Blueprint to Kingdom Come, where now he's this kind of cosmopolitan. By the time you get the Magna Carta Holy Grail, he's a different hove. Still brilliant, still amazing, but he's a grown man doing a very different thing. Same thing with Nas, by the time you get to Life is Good, the kind of Hear My Dear album, you see a very different Nas than you see in Lost Tapes or than you see in It Was Written, the kind of mafioso uh, Nas back to Illmatic, which I still regard as the greatest hip hop album ever made. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of like a, an ongoing theme of Lad TV, where I, I basically say that Nas has one classic album. Which that's is insane. Illmatic. That's insane. I know, people say that. That's but, insane. But that, that's my stance. And, and honestly, I'm gonna tell you something else. My opinion is Nas is one of the worst beat pickers in history. Wow. You know, except for Illmatic, which I kind of feel someone else had a hand in. A large professor, I think, came in and said, hey, use this pre premier beat. Because when you look at Nas's beat picking, it's like he has great lyrics and the beats really just don't. I'll, don't I'll really say this. To, I, 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 to the first point, saying Nas only has one classic album, I think that's just one classic album. bonkers, right? <laughs> it, it was written is one of the most underrated albums of, 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 the, of the late 90s. I mean, it was written as, a, as damn near perfect. I mean, it's an amazing. I, Illmatic to me stands above everything else. It's not like Illmatic. No, nothing's like Illmatic. I mean, but by that logic, I mean nothing was going to stand up. If you, a classic album doesn't mean it's the best thing you made, 
right? If you if you're a legend, right? I mean, uh, what's Jay Z's best album? We gonna say Blueprint or Reasonable, Reasonable Doubt. Doubt? Reasonable Doubt. Okay, so Blueprint's not as good as Reasonable Doubt. Blueprint is still a classic, right? Blueprint. I mean, you know, I mean, to me, you know, I have a, a smaller, you know, pool of classic albums. You know, what I mean, like I don't, I don't hand out. You know, I, I only, say, I say that Michael Jackson only had one classic album. See again, you know? that would make me. Want, yeah, you should start doing drug testing at Vlad TV because. <laughs> That shit's. You don't think Off the Wall was a classic? Off the Wall was great. It wasn't Thriller. I argue. I, I can even argue Off the Wall is better than Thriller. If you if you're talking Some straight, people say that me, me and Charlamagne go back and forth over this on Twitter every few months. Yeah, you know Off the saying? Wall. If you at a party, you gonna hear Off the Wall more than you gonna hear uh, a Thriller give, on a, on a given night. Off the Wall has more hits, more classic. But I mean, I think I think Off the Wall, Thriller, Bad are all. Class. I, I'm with you though. I don't call everything a classic, so I'm not that guy. Mm-hmm. I think Michael Jackson has three classic albums. I would, I could live with two, but I think it'd be kind of difficult not to call Off the Wall a classic. Coltrane, it's kind of hard. To, I mean, Coltrane has a few classic albums. None of them better than Love Supreme, but it still exists. Stevie, a couple classic albums. Nothing better than Songs in the Key of Life. Nas, I think, has Illmatic, which is the gold standard of hip hop. But I think you could make a case for it was written. I think you could make a, and I think Stillmatic, if for no other reason, it got five mics in the source. It was, uh, it, it had Ether on it, which is one of the great battle raps in hip hop history. I, I think it, it would be tough to make a case against Stillmatic for me. Um, as far as beat making, I can see the point. I don't. I don't always beat, like Nas. Beat, beat picking. Beat picking. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, when first album, great beats. Second album, I would say great beats. Very Dre influenced. S- S- second album, I don't think for Nas had great. You know, because beat picking doesn't mean just picking a great beat. It's picking picking a great beat that works for you. No doubt. I think you it was written work for him. I I think when you get to, to Stillmatic and Nostradamus. I mean, that's still mad. When you get to Nostradamus and I Am, I think you have a better, I think you have an argument. Some, some good hits and then some, some, some things like big things and things where I'm like, yo, this, ain't, this track ain't for you, this flow ain't for you. But then when you get to uh, Godson, much better beat selection. When you, and, and when you, and when better, you listen, better, but not great. I mean, Nas actually used the same beat for like two of his singles. That's very true. Look, Nas Which is just like, yo, like who, who does that? Like, come on, Nas. I, actually, that come doesn't on, bother cut, me, cut but... Nas's ear for beats is not as strong as his lyrical ability. I still think Nas stands as the greatest MC ever. So, ever? Yes. I, I put Nas is in my top five. I mean, it alternates, but Nas is always in my top five. Uh, okay, always so in my top on, three. Hold on, hold on. Okay, top five, yeah. But you said ever, so you would put Nas above Biggie, above Jay. Above Biggie's not in my top five. What's that? Biggie's not in my top five. Biggie's not in your top five. No. Well, why? Lyrically? Biggie's in my top ten. Biggie's number for me, top five is Jay-Z without a doubt. Okay. Nas without a doubt. Okay. Andre 3000 without a doubt. Okay. Um, I'm putting Lauren Hill in my top five. I mean, I can see how you would say that, except that she only really had one album. Biggie only had two albums and you're making him the number one MC of all time. See? Okay. okay. You got me on that one. You got me on that yeah. one. All right. Okay. Lauren Hill, go right. on. Right. And, and also, you got to count Lawrence Fuji's albums. I mean, she, she was the... I yeah, mean, no, you're right. No, you you're ain't right. listening to the score for Prize. You know what I'm saying? Sh- sh- shout out to Prize. I mean, actually, he's a friend of mine. I love Prize. But like I said, Prize's impact on the track is his beat, his beat selection, his ad libs, and his energy. You're not going to Prize for bars. You're just not. And I don't think... Prize would tell you that. You, you ain't, you, Prize don't think he was a lyrical well, Prize, genius. Prize was the business guy. Yeah, he was and a lot that's of things. What everyone has told me. Yeah. Everything fits. You, all those parts fit. I don't take nothing away from Prize. I don't take nothing away from Clef. I like both of them. But El Boogie had, had brought the lyrics. So for me, that's my four. For five, at this moment, right now, I, I got Black Thought in, as my as, as my Black four. Thought. Oh, yes. Nah, I can't. I can't ride with you on that one. Lyrically, I, I mean, I'm from Philly, so it. you might say I'm biased. Yeah. I think one more classic album. You might have to put two more cla- two more great albums. You got to put Kendrick in that fifth slot. I think you could put Kendrick in that slot. But if you said no, if you put um, Eminem in that slot, I wouldn't get mad. I don't think he's top five, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't trip about that. If you put Biggie in that slot, I wouldn't trip about that. If you put Rakim in that slot, I wouldn't trip about that. But I mean, I would actually put J. Cole over Kendrick. In what? Rapping? In, in ter- in terms Making of, rapping? In terms of creating, creating songs. Wow! In song, in song creation, and I feel it was, it was a crime that J. Cole didn't get nothing in the last Grammys. I thought that was straight bullshit. You know what I'm saying? I think Kendrick is more artsy. You know what I'm saying? But I think he's I think of, he's a better lyricist. The, the, if you talk about just pure skill, like at the level of like Lupe level, just lyricism, I think Kendrick is a better lyricist than J. Cole. I, I think I think Kendrick is more artsy. I think I think he he does stuff that's really more off the wall and you know kind of like you know 
you know, he, he goes off on a limb in terms of his stuff. But in terms of like, you know, songs that I want to listen to, J. Cole is more musical. His songs, Ooh. I feel, are better. Hey, man, listen, me and Swizz were arguing over this during the Grammys, and he and he produced on J. Cole's album, I believe. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, he was like, so, and, and, he, and he, was, he was saying Kendrick, you know, like. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think they're in the same class. I think, I think Kendrick is like LeBron right now. Okay. And I think J. Cole is like KD. Extraordinary. Both top of the game. No, no, there's nothing wrong with being KD. He's just not LeBron. Okay. And I, I, I love J. Cole. I love every album J. Cole has made. I love all of his projects. I like the live album he just did. Politically, I love where J. Cole is. I think he's in a great place. When I was down there in Ferguson, the only people that came through was J. Cole, Nelly. I mean, it, was a, it was a small number of people that came through and showed love and really was on the ground with the people. Nothing but respect and love for J. Cole. If, I'm, if I need a one MC from this generation, though, I'm taking, I'm taking Kendrick. I mean, and to me, Good, Good Kid, Mad City is the best solo debut album since, I don't even know, since Get Rich, for sure. Since uh, Get Rich? Okay. I, I can see that. And, and maybe, may, maybe top five ever debut albums in hip-hop. I mean, it's, it's that good. For me, it's, 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 you know, it's like Ready to Die, Reasonable, This. Yeah, you know I mean, it, it's a very small number, you know what I mean? And he's up in there. Well, you know, you mentioned Praz recently. So I interviewed Praz, and the one thing that I brought up, which uh, got a lot of people surprised, was that during Obama's second election, not, uh, Praz actually donated $1.2 of his own money to, uh, to a Democratic super PAC. You donated $1.2 million to, to Barack Obama's campaign? Yo, where are you getting these information from? Is that not true? I'm starting to think you CIA, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, this yeah, is what I, mean, I do. It's true. You know it's out there like, now. You... It's out. It's out in the in the in, in the in, in the universe. Yeah, I did. To his to a super PAC. Through a super PAC. So so your corporation donated one point two million dollars to the Barack Obama super PAC. No no no, to a super PAC that backs Obama. He didn't have a super PAC. Why do you think that someone like Praz? who has been out of the limelight for a while, you know, financially good, but not at a level of a Jay-Z or, a, you know, or, or even maybe even a 50 cent at his height. He's donating over a million dollars of his own money into the political process. No one, but you never really hear of any, uh, anyone else in the hip hop community really doing that. Well, first, I, I hope he didn't, I hope he bundled that and didn't actually pull out cash, you know, just because of campaign financing. But, but I, I think, um, I think he has a belief in an investment in the Obama uh, administration, the Obama campaign. Uh, and it's funny, when I was in uh, Denver in 08, when Obama was getting nominated, I saw so many rappers in the audience, so many people, so many actresses, so many, everybody, showing him love in a way that I hadn't seen for any other presidential campaign. Um, so I think Obama resonated with them in a very different way. And also, I think it has to do with the kind of coming of age of hip hop. Hip hop was always the kind of rage against the machine you know, challenge the, the state, and then suddenly hip hop has gotten older. There's a generation of MCs that aren't 18 anymore. They got kids, and they're thinking about the world in a different way. And many of them are mainstream Democrats now, and so they've grown up and got the minivan, so to speak, you know, and Obama in some ways represents that for them uh, in the best ways possible and some of the most troublesome ways possible. You know, like all black people, I think there was an investment in saying my president is black. Um, I think some of the hip hop generation did donate money. I think they just weren't public about it. You know, I know some MCs in particular, some of the big names who I know, who donated a ton of money, but but also did uh, did uh, surrogate work. They went state to state, stumping for Obama. You know, they did other things to make the campaign happen. Do you know? Can you say who that is? No, no. But okay. But what I will say is that uh, is that the hip hop generation, I think, is and, and hip hop artists of this generation are very active in the Obama campaign. For me, what I want to see is a bit more of a, I want to see a return to the challenge of the presidency. I want hip hop to be the one saying, what are y'all doing? We need to do more. You know, when there's not a black guy in office, I'm hoping whether it's Hillary or whether it's Trump, I hope that the hip hop artists will be making music once again, telling us that we got to stop these wars, that we got to stop the occupation of Palestine, that we have to stop police terrorism, that we have to stop giving all our money to Wall Street, that we have to end rape culture. I want to see the hip-hop generation of this hip-hop generation really speak out and follow that tradition that we've always been a part of from the 80s forward, really from the 70s forward. Well, I mean, as someone who's involved in the 
you know, in the political world. What does it mean when an individual gives a million dollars to a campaign? Well, you know, typically what happens when people are donating large sums of money or allowing large sums of money to be made, they're usually through bundling and other things, uh, or donating, a, a, like you, to your point, like a million dollars to an actual super PAC or something. Um, there, is influ- there is influence that can be wielded. There are favors to be asked. A million dollars isn't a, a lot of money in politics. I mean, it's a lot of money. It, you, you definitely have, you're definitely going to get a phone call. You, you definitely gonna get invited to like the cool shit if you if, if you arrange for a, a, anybody to get a million dollars. A million dollars is a million dollars. Um, but it's not the kind of influence where like you have to worry about, like prize ain't shaping policy, you know, you know, but he is someone in the room. He is someone who, who earns the respect. Some of it for celebrities is ego. Some of it is just wanting to be able to say, I can get the president on the phone. That's worth a lot, right? But some of it is genuinely believing in the project of, of, of justice and democracy and freedom and they believe Obama can, can lead that they're going to move in that direction. Now, if you don't believe that, that's a different, that's a different thing. Um, people in politics generally donate large sums of money so that they can get favors and so that they can inform policy, so that they can get their agenda squarely, whether it's reproductive rights, whether it's guns, whether it's um, environmental uh, activism, whatever it is, your money is your entry point in the room. Well, you know, you and I are a similar age. And I, I remember watching a Chris Rock special uh, when there was a rumor that Colin Powell was going to run for vice president. Do you remember this whole thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, he said you'll never get a black vice president because the first thing that will happen is the president will get killed and, you know, the vice president will become the president. And whoever kills him is going to be a hero in jail. Um, <laughs> lo and behold, eight, eight, nine years later, we have a black president. Black president, yes. Black president for two terms. Now, you have actually said that the Barack Obama presidency is overrated. Um, Correct? Yeah, I mean, I'm critical of it. Overrated depends on how, overrated. It depends on who's rating it, right? But yes, I, I, I don't think it's been as successful a presidency as other people have. Yeah. Okay, and why is that? Because I'm looking at the entire world. I, you know, there have been some extraordinary gains. Um, the most significant piece of domestic policy that we've seen since the Voting Rights Act of 65 comes with the passage of universal health care under Barack Obama. Uh, the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell comes under Barack Obama. Uh, gay marriage, Barack Obama. All these things come under an Obama administration. So let's not pretend that nothing has happened. My, my point isn't that nothing has happened. It's that the most vulnerable are still catching hell and there's been a considerable amount of work that could have been done to target those vulnerable populations and we haven't really done that. And when I look globally, the, the, the suffering is even more expansive. When I look globally, I look at Syrians, I look at Palestinians, I look at people in Yemen, I look at people in Afghanistan, I look at people in Somalia, I look at people anywhere actually on the continent of Africa and I see exploitation, I see social misery, I see random violence, and I see a United States machine that has either been behind it, enabled it, or stood back and didn't do anything to stop it. So if I was fighting against the war in 04 against Bush, and if I was saying in 07, look, I hate these, these predator drones that are killing innocent people, the fact that you know those predator drones now have an Obama sticker on them instead of a Bush sticker doesn't make you feel any better if you're getting hit with them in Yemen or Somalia. Doesn't make you feel better in Afghanistan. Doesn't make you feel better you know, when, when you're on the wrong side of American democracy. And so um, I think if we, as we celebrate Obama for his achievements, and as we are quite honest and eyes wide open about how much we love that family, there's something psychologically beautiful about seeing a black family in the White House, seeing those wonderful children grow up in front of us, seeing Michelle Obama, who was by far the coolest first lady we've ever had in the history of, the, of any country in the world. All that is dope. All of it. But my job as a critic, my job as an activist, my job as an intellectual is to tell the truth and keep track of, of suffering. And suffering also expanded under uh, this administration. Um, and my job is to challenge it. Well, I mean, I can't really speak on the global implications of the Obama administration because I'm not as familiar with that. But I can tell you, as someone who is in the business world, America was on the brink in 2007, 2008. Mm-hmm. Like the mess that Bush left to Obama 
with the housing crash, the stock market crash, jobs Awful. were fucked up. Like people, people always like to say like Obama has done nothing for the economy. Like you're really tripping yeah, right it's now. Bonkers. Two, 2008 was fucked up. And as someone who has a large amount of money in the stock market and gets to see what happens month after month, year after year, and the stock market is indicative of what's happening with businesses, you know, stocks don't go up when businesses lose money. Stocks only go up when businesses make more and more money. So to, to pull America out of the brink, you know, which really could have gone either way. We could have been, we could be in a depression right now. Yeah, I mean, in the worst case scenario, yeah, we could be Greece. We could yes. be worse than the depression, we could, right? We could be Greece. Yeah. Right. We could be Greece right now. And I've been to Greece, actually. Yeah. I was there right when everything was falling apart. And it was fucked up. It was yeah. dangerous to be in the streets. To, to actually say, to, to see what Obama has done, it kind of bothers me to say, you know, when I hear people criticizing him and say that he's overrated and that type of thing, you know, from my personal opinion. Well, I mean, I think, again, overrated. It, it would be like if I said um, an athlete was overrated who averaged 25 points a game. Like, I might, you know what I mean? That doesn't mean they doesn't mean they didn't put up numbers. Doesn't mean they're not talented. Overrated just means you know not over celebrated. That that maybe what we're saying is there isn't all there. Um, again, I I could list accomplishments of the Obama administration, and yes, he inherited a mess from George W. Bush. But the first thing we have to understand is that the the economic mess that Barack Obama inherited, he inherited not just from Bush. He inherited from Clinton, from Reagan, from Daddy Bush, right? There's been 30 years of deregulation. There's been 30 years of hands-off corporations. There's been 30 years of exploiting vulnerable citizens. And so that logic all comes to a head and, and the bubble bursts, as you know, uh, mm -hmm. right in time for an Obama administration to come in and save it. An extraordinary move, no doubt about that. But as you mentioned, when, when, I, when I'm looking at the S&P or if I'm looking at, um, if I'm looking at any measure of, America's economic vitality, you're right, things are much better. People have confidence in the, in the stock market. Uh, we've avoided the fiscal cliff, we've avoided the debt ceiling, all the shit that like, makes you feel like there's constant panic, we've avoided. I mean, that takes some stewardship, I don't deny that. But again, my concern isn't that Wall Street's okay. I'm worried about Martin Luther King Boulevard. And all the financial rescues that happened for Wall Street didn't make it to MLK. And that's my concern. So we still have everyday people who didn't get uh, the type of economic relief that they needed. We have students who never got the kind of forbearance on loans and the kind of debt forgiveness that corporations got. You know, that's what I'm talking about. And that's what gets ignored. We have programs like My Brother's Keeper, which sound great, but that's not public policy, that's philanthropy, right? We've even privatized public policy. I'm saying, I'm not saying don't celebrate Obama at all. I'm not saying don't pat Obama on the back for the good things. But I'm saying let's not let him off the hook for other things. I could, I could look at George W. Bush and say, yeah, I mean, AIDS funding in Africa went up un better, more under him than any other president in the last 50 years. I could say that and it would be true, right? I could say uh, George W. Bush put forth one of the more progressive immigration policies. It didn't, nothing, nothing happened with it, but he put forth one of the more progressive immigration policies of the last 20 years. You know, amnesty, family reconciliation, all that stuff. But I'd be a fool to focus on that and ignore the fact that he put us in the war in Iraq. I'd be a fool to ignore, you know what I mean? I can name 15 other things he didn't do. So for me, it's not about trashing Obama. It's about three things. We respect him because a lot of people don't. White supremacy is prevalent. Obama has been the most disrespected president in American history. We have to respect him. We also have to protect him, right? I have to defend him against the irrational Fox News criticism that comes, the irrational Donald Trump criticism, right? the kind of stuff you just pointed out. But then I also have to correct him. So you can respect him and protect him, but you must also correct him. And correction is what makes presidents great. Lincoln is great because of Frederick Douglass. My job, not individually, because I don't have delusions of grandeur. I don't think I'm Frederick Douglass. I think collectively we're Frederick Douglass. We have to be Obama's Frederick Douglass. And in a few months, six months from now, we're gonna have to be somebody else's Frederick Douglass. Well, you said that you would rather Trump be president than Hillary Clinton. That's not what I said. That's not what you said? No, what I said is, and, okay. and I, I, I am not afraid of a Trump presidency. I would prefer Jill Stein to be president because that's who I'm voting for. My preference, Independent. Yeah, my preference isn't for Donald, I, I, I hope Donald Trump isn't president. I want Donald Trump to never be president. I don't know anybody on my side of the aisle that wants Donald Trump to be president. Yeah. 
But I think what's more important is building a long-term political movement. And to build a long-term political movement, we have to make short-term sacrifices. And that could mean, it could mean a down. I'm, I'm, I'm eyes wide open about the possibility of a Trump presidency. That's not my desired goal. I fully support, let me be very clear, I fully support strategic voting. If you're in a decidedly blue state, a decidedly red state, vote your conscience, right? If you're in Texas, vote, vote, you can vote for your dog, you can vote for your puppy, doesn't matter. Donald Trump gonna win. You in Georgia, you can vote for this, this camera stand, don't matter. Donald Trump gonna win. If you in California, doesn't matter who you vote for. You can vote for prize, right? Doesn't matter. Hillary Clinton gonna win, right? Okay. But when you get to Nevada, when you get to Florida, when you get to Ohio, when you get to Virginia, when you get to Pennsylvania, now you have a contested election. That could be a time to strategically vote for the candidate who you want to win, right? So that's a very different argument than saying, vote your conscience and let the chips fall where they may. I understand the Supreme Court. I understand the value of having a, a, a radical movement with a Democrat in office versus a Republican. Let me say one more thing about that, though. I personally don't plan to do that. I register in Pennsylvania, and I'm not voting for Hillary Clinton because I cannot morally reconcile voting for Hillary Clinton. Remember, I said vote your conscience. Okay. And, and why is that? Why can't you morally vote for Hillary Clinton? Let me ask you a question. I, I'll put it back on you for a second. If there were a candidate who believed... Um, that being gay was a sin, it was a crime, and they're all going to hell, mm -hmm. right? Shared your politics on everything else, but believe that. Could you vote for them? Probably not. Right. So you have things that are a moral non-starter for you, right? Just by virtue of you doing or believing a certain thing, I can't vote for you. Even if you're the best choice for me, because if Hillary Clinton believed what I just said, she'd still be a better choice than Donald Trump. But you wouldn't vote for her because there's a moral non-starter. For me, Killing innocent people abroad through predator drones is a moral non-starter. For me, that vicious occupation of Palestine by the state of Israel is a non-starter. For me, for me, uh, supporting the death penalty under any circumstances in this country, given our history, is a moral non-starter. And quite frankly, her advocacy for policies from the 90s, her advocacy for them, a moral non-starter. And I could get past that if she, I could get past that if I felt like there was contrition and reflection and advancement. I'm not convinced that there is, but if there was, I could get past that. But there are moral non-starters for me for Hillary Clinton. And that is the reason why Wait, so I can't do So you feel that it. there should not be a death penalty at all? No. It, under any circumstance? Yeah, under any circumstance. The, 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 the Charleston shooter should not get the, get the death penalty. That would be, yeah, I'm saying under no circumstance. Any example you so, give, it'd still be no, because I'm saying under no circumstance. I mean, I, I'm, I, I believe in the death penalty for certain situations. Why? Do, do, I feel, do I feel the death penalty exactly the way it works now? No. Do I believe the Charleston shooter deserves the death penalty? Why 100%. does the Charleston shooter deserve the death penalty? Uh, the fact that, the, that this guy walked into a church of people that actually treated him kindly. So wait, and, so, and, so let me push you on that. Just, began to just kill people. Let me push you on that. What if they were, what if they were complete assholes to him and he killed them? Would you still want them to get the death penalty? Uh, if they were completely innocent, yeah. Okay. What if there were only two of them instead of nine? Would you still want them to get the death penalty? Uh, yeah. Okay. What if there was one of them and he was a terrible person? Would you want the death penalty? Well, I find a, a terrible person. I don't know. This, uh, is a, this is a great conversation, actually. Cause I mean, I've never because, actually, cause, I've never cause, actually explored it in this way. So let's cause, keep cause, going. Because as, as I'm hearing you talk about it, it seems like your death penalty net is actually pretty wide, right? Because what people do is this is what death penalty advocates do, right? They take the most extreme case, and they say, "What if somebody ran in your house, raped and killed your whole family, set them on fire, and left?" I bet you want the death penalty then. And I'm like, okay. "Well, yeah, I, I might want it, but I also don't feel like I'm at my most fair and rational." insane when somebody runs in and rapes and kills my whole family right that might not be the best time for me to make public policy so right i mean well here's the thing i mean i, do, I don't believe in nonviolence. you know i do believe uh, in an eye for an eye i do believe that if you commit murder you should walk into that situation knowing that you might get the death penalty that you might die in the process you know if someone what does that pulls do, out, you know i mean because because you're you're a gun owner yourself right yep 
Okay. So I'm not, I'm someone, not nonviolent. Let me be clear. My op- opposition to the death penalty isn't that I feel like there's no appropriate time for violence. Let me be clear. My opposition to the death penalty is rooted in a few things. One, we get it wrong way too often. It's a technological argument, right? We swear people did it until we find out they didn't, right? And we've had too many cases where we were convinced somebody did it until they didn't do it, right? Except they're dead. So, so if you say, yeah, but the Charleston shooter, we have no doubt he did it. That's such a small number of people that we can't make public policy around that. The second thing is that I don't think, because almost all, I mean, usually this is circumstantial stuff. It's eyewitness stuff, which is normally flawed. There's all kinds of reasons. Or it's, it's testing, which we know doesn't work um, all the time. The second thing is, I don't think the state has the moral authority to kill its citizens. No nation that has executed this many Native Americans, that has allowed the Tuskegee experiment to happen, that has enslaved its, its own, that has built on the exploitation and enslavement of its own people, has the moral authority to decide who gets to live and who gets to die. Okay. And the third reason, hold on, and the third reason is it doesn't work. Because you, you, your, your point was you should go into any situation knowing that if you do this thing, this is going to happen. The implicit argument of that is that it will dissuade people from doing it, right? That if I knew I was going to get killed for this, maybe I won't kill somebody. But all the data, all the evidence, all the science throughout American history shows that the death penalty actually doesn't make people less likely to kill. In fact, there are states, like, there are states where, where there's a death penalty, murder rates are actually higher. Okay. So someone breaks into your house. Uh-huh. And they're armed. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you see that they're in your house with a gun. Do you try to kill that person? Yes. Okay. I'm defending so myself. It, it, so in a way, you're actually enacting the death penalty on this person. Yes. Remember, I said the state doesn't have the capacity and the moral authority to do it. I didn't say individuals didn't. And also, here's the other difference. The state isn't operating in self-defense. I believe in protecting life. I'm, I am shooting that person to protect life. The state is not doing it to protect life, right? Now, you would argue, well, the state is because this person could be a crazy killer and could kill somebody else. Again, there's no evidence, historically, empirically, whatever, that, ki- that the death penalty stops people from killing other people. Now, you could argue, well, they won't, that person won't kill nobody else. True, but that could happen in secure confinement. That could happen in a prison. That could happen in a mental hospital. That could happen in a lot of places. You could make sure somebody didn't kill somebody without killing them yourself. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I feel that the, the concept of the death penalty keeps people from doing certain types of things in, in the same way. But that it doesn't. What I'm saying whole, is it actually. Well, I mean, I, mean, I mean, if you look at the situation with police officers, the fact that they could kill people with zero repercussions psychologically gets them to kill more people. That's what I personally believe. You know, right. The but data the pro- may, may say one thing or another, but the reality is, is that if you know you have no repercussions for doing certain types of activities, you are more than likely to do those types of activities based on human nature. Wait, so you're saying that if you, can, if you were in a room with no cameras, you could murder somebody and get away with it, you would? I think a lot of people would definitely kill. I'm asking would you. A lot, uh, people would definitely kill people they didn't like if they knew there was no repercussions for it. Right. So... In certain look, circumstances, look, 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 look what happens in North Korea. When, when, you, when you look at like the, the leaders, you know, when you look at dictators in general, they have no repercussions for their actions. Look at the, you know, the whole absolute power corrupts absolutely. Look at look at the type of things that happen in these types. Right, of but you but you're willing to give the state absolute power to kill its citizens through the death penalty. Well, it's, it's not absolute power because you know, even putting someone on death row is you know takes decades. Right. Because we get and, it wrong and, and so they much. Stay, and they stay on death row for decades until, like, you know, I mean, a person doesn't get a trial, then get killed a month later. That never happens. Well, thankfully, you know, the Innocence Project estimates that as many as, I think the number is either 20 or 25 percent of people on death row might, are, are, might be innocent. It, even knowing that the number could be that high, you're still OK with killing people? I mean, I'm not familiar with that number. If you're saying that's what it is, I'd have to look into well, it. Well, let me ask you, what, that, that, that what, is, what margin of error would you be comfortable with? I mean, obviously it would be zero. Right, but, but, but you, can, you can see that it's impossible for the number to be zero, right? It, it is impossible for the number to so, be zero. So just by agreeing to the death penalty, you're, you're, you're conceding to a world where people who didn't do the crime are going to get executed. I mean, I mean it's an interesting point. I, I, see, I see where you're going with this, and I don't have a good answer for that, for that type of thing, because I mean, I, I agree with you to a certain degree that if, if one person gets killed 
who did not do it, you failed the yeah. entire system. But that that doesn't automatically exclude when you have people, you know, like like the terrorists in Boston that 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 blew up and, and maimed, you know, what close to a hundred people. When you have the Charleston shooter, when you have uh, Timothy McVeigh, when you have when you have just people uh, who who do horrific things. You know, I personally believe they, they should die, and that's my personal belief. No, I get it. I just, I, I, you, you have yet to make an argument for, for, for why. Your, your argument has been that it stops people from doing it, and, I, and I, I'm showing all the data. I mean, there's, done, there's tons of data that shows that that's not true. It doesn't. It just doesn't. And in fact, there are studies that show that when people have a pro- intense punishments for things, they can be more likely to do it because they, I'll give you an example. Studies show that when, when, when daycares charge people like, a, like $10 a minute for being late, people are more likely to be late, not less. You know why? Because now you don't feel guilty for being late because there's a punishment. It's like, well, shit, I'm 15 minutes late, I'll just pay it. The person just wants to go home. So when you show up there five minutes later, like, yo, where you been? Like, you feel guilty, you rush to get there, you don't piss people off. But if they have a penalty, then you feel like you're paying. So if you're a suicide bomber, and the state's gonna kill you, that's kind of the point. So it doesn't stop people from committing the initial crime. Also, if you have a mental illness and you go around on a killing spree, the threat of death isn't gonna stop you because it's a mental illness. Right, I mean, but there are specific laws where the death penalty is not enacted because the person is not competent to stand trial when you have a mental illness situation. Do you think it's possible to be a serial killer and not have a mental illness? I'm sorry. Do you think it's possible to be a serial killer and not have a mental illness? Uh, yeah, I think it is. See, I, I think people. I, I, I think I think certain people just like killing. You know, I mean, just like certain people. You don't like think that's hunting. a mental illness? <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I, I think that the humans are kind of barbaric in nature. You know what I'm saying? Like, like if if you look at historically, um, humans have killed each other. Has every person that's killed someone else have a mental illness? No, or, we, we were or, talking specifically about killing there, sprees. You know, not, are not, people inherent? Are, are humans inherently violent? When you're on a certain side of it, it makes complete sense. When you're on the other side of it, it doesn't make sense. And too often, we get it wrong. And so, I, I, I think if you take a second and reflect on this, you'll realize why this doesn't make right. You said that if one person dies that shouldn't die from the death penalty, it's probably a mistake. Mm-hmm. There's no moment in history where we haven't gotten death penalty wrong. And there's no reason to believe that we, that we would always have it foolproof. So that alone, to me, is an argument. And then the, the argument that it's a deterrent. It's a, it's a strong argument. And, yeah. I, and I, you know, and it, it does cause me to kind of think about it, but I still believe in the death penalty. It's blood, I mean, but, but it's a very good point. It's bloodlust. I think, I think ultimately the, what you talked about, our desire for revenge, sometimes trumps our desire for justice. And if somebody killed my whole family, I'd want them to die too. Mm-hmm. I'd want revenge. I'm just not convinced that that's my best self. I'm not convinced that that's my most rational, my most sane, my most humane, my most fair, my most just. Shit, if you cut me off on the highway on a, on a given day, I might want to blow your car. You know what I mean? Like, that's not the right time for me to make public policy. So, I, I, with a step back, anyway, that's my, that's my death penalty stand. Now, you were for Fox at one point. I did. I did. You did. Uh, now, you actually were on Bill O'Reilly's show, and you know Bill O'Reilly personally. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And you've said that Bill O'Reilly is not as bad as people make him out to be. Bill was, was my biggest advocate, man. Um, he was the reason I got a job at Fox News. He, he protected me at Fox News in many ways, and I learned how to do TV from him. I learned how to host TV from Bill O'Reilly. I mean, uh, my biggest influences as hosts were Star Jones, Bill O'Reilly, um, in terms of up close watching it, you know, and, and, and Larry King. Okay. And all very different people. Mm-hmm. Now, did you hear the comments that Bill O'Reilly made about the, the White House being built by slaves and how they were well fed and yeah. nicely housed? Yeah, did man. You, did you cringe? I, I cringed. I, did I, you cringe? I, I cringed. I threw my laptop. You know, sometimes <laughs> he just says, like, he, yeah, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Okay. It's absolutely. Now, ridiculous. But, but this is your man right here saying that. I mean, like I said, I, I've been professionally sort of mentored and trained through observation and, and through conversation with Bill O'Reilly. Doesn't mean we had the same worldview. Mm. I can still say, yo, that shit was racist. Like, it, it, it's, not, it's not either or, it's both and. Sometimes racists teach you how to do stuff. Right, I mean, I, I, I don't think you could really sit there and say, they were slaves, but they had it pretty good. Like, like you can't really put those two together. Well, so, I mean, I, I think it's a 
fairly com common white person position to take, though. He didn't say they had it pretty good. What he said, though, is that they were well-fed and well-housed. Um, but they were st still slaves. Right. No, you, you, you get no <laughs> argument from me. I, I agree with you. I mean, it's an absurd comment. It's insensitive. It's ahistoric. And it, 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 it rests on a set of assumptions that we can't hold on to, like that slave masters were telling the truth or that, you know, or that somehow being... I mean, what does it mean to be well-housed if you're being raped at night? Like, right. I got a queen size bed, I got 600 thread count sheets, but I'm getting raped. Like, I mean, that, that maybe that, that, I would argue that's not even being well housed. So there are all kinds of, of, of ways to think about this in a, differently. Um, but I think we often look at things through the lens of white people and through the lens of white experience. And I think Bill O'Reilly is often victim of that. Do I think Bill O'Reilly inherently believes that white people are better than black people? No, I actually don't. I don't think that he inherently has those kinds of hostile attitudes toward black people. But I think his worldview like many white people, is informed by white supremacy, by racism. And I think that that's just a function of being white in America. I don't think Bill, it's just Bill O'Reilly. I think it's most, most white people. I mean, do you think that there'll ever be reparations for black people in no. America in the same way that there was reparations for Jews no. uh, after Germany? I don't believe that there will be. Um, America doesn't have an appetite for that. Um, America doesn't have a desire for it. You know, to repair the damage done would be to acknowledge our ugly history of slavery and white supremacy. Um, I'd love to see a day where we repair the damage done, whatever that looks like, but I don't believe that repair is gonna come in the form of traditional reparations models in the United States. I think we should advocate for it and fight for it. Um, and we should think very carefully about what that would look like, um, but I'm not optimistic. I mean, if you know, I've been through Israel before and you actually saw buildings and so forth that were paid by reparations, German reparations. Yeah. Like you saw like Mercedes everywhere and so forth. And I, I actually looked into this and studied it and there actually were reparations and it, it didn't make what happened okay, but there was a certain level of healing when there was an admit and you know, when someone admitted that they fucked up. Right. You now, know? And the fact that America is not admitting that they fucked up. I mean, because I actually, you know, researched some of this stuff. Like, they were actually breeding black people like animals back in the day. Oh, you, I you mean, know what I'm saying? Like, like they were actually trying to create the biggest, strongest slaves they could by, by basically forcing the women and finding the biggest men, men and biggest women. Like, it's really hor horrific stuff. Oh, it's, 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 actually, it's awful. It's absolutely awful. But that's what I mean. It's, and just as an aside, because we... I, I, the, the, those monuments in Israel were built on Palestinian land and stolen Palestinian land in the occupi occupation of Palestine. So this would be very clear that even the healing came at the same time that a new trauma was being initiated in, in 1948 and really even prior to 1948 uh, with the establishment of the state. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you 100 percent. Repair needs to be done. And, and the recognition is as important as anything else. When we had the, that conference on race in Durban back in 2001, the United States walked out. They wouldn't even engage in a conversation about reparations. The United States won't even issue an apology for slavery. Hmm. I mean, this is the country we're talking about here. We have to come to terms with this ugly past before we can do anything about it. I agree. Now, you've explained uh, in the past that black people can't be racist because they lack the institutional power necessary to, to deploy racism. Yeah. Explain that. Um, I mean, you just did. I mean, I, I think if we're, it depends on how, I mean, if the problem with that argument with the problem with the conversation or the debates that circle around my, my point is that we're often defining terms differently. If I said to you, Vlad, how do you define racism? What would you say? Uh, to judge someone by their appearance as opposed to the person that they are. Okay. Now, I would say that's prejudice, right? Not racism. But if I... Well, I mean, I guess it's racism to judge someone by their race as opposed to the actual person. That'd be racism. So if I say all Asians are smart, that's racist? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I would argue that's stereotyping. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a question of definitions, right? So if... Um, I, mean, I mean, usually racism implies a negative connotation as opposed to a positive. You know, by me saying all black people are smart, am I being racist? Like, you know, I don't think, I don't think you know, someone would accuse me of racism by saying that. Right, but maybe we should, right? Because, I mean, there's, there's a... There's a all right, that's another piece of it. We can talk about that in a second. But my point okay. is, if you're defining racism as judging somebody based on their skin, then yeah, black people can be racist. If you're, if you're defining racism by uh, denying people access to something based on their race, which, which I think is more along the way, sure. Right? If you say 
uh, having beliefs about a person of all people of a certain sort just because they are, they are of that sort. Uh, all black people can dance. All black people can jump. If you're defining that as racism, then sure, black people can be racist. My People take my definition of racism, delete it, insert theirs, and then get mad that I don't, that about what I'm saying, and I'm not saying what they're saying. In other words, my definition of racism, and it's not my personal definition, if you read B- Beverly uh, Tatum, if you read any sort of academic scholarship on racism, racism isn't, desi- isn't defined as individual prejudice. It's defined as uh, the kind of, um, the ability, like one person, Nobles defi- defines it as the ability to create reality for other people, essentially, and to have them believe in it as if it is their own. It's a, it's an, mm-hmm. it's a structural investment. Um, if you define racism as the ability to wield power, institutional power, structurally over another race, then yeah, black people can't be racist. We don't have, we're not institutionally empowered in the same way as white people. And I'm not talking about individual black, I'm not talking about Obama or Eric Holder or Loretta Lynch, I'm talking about institutionally, the ability, of, white people's, white norms define our reality. When we talk about, when you go into the store and buy a flesh-colored Band-Aid and it's peach, that's reflective of the fact that white norms govern what we say the normal body looks like. That's why dolls and toys and models and TV hosts tend to look a certain way because they reflect the norm, the normative ideals of society. And so I'm saying that in that capacity, black people don't have the power to be racism. Can black people discriminate? Yes. Can black people stereotype? Yes. Can black people be prejudiced? Absolutely. I'm not denying any of that. But racism is a different conversation. Well, I did an interview with with Eddie Griffin uh, at the end of last year. And this interview ended up going everywhere, from Fox to MSNBC to, to, to everywhere. And one of the things that he said that really got a lot of people riled up was, there is a systematic effort to destroy every black male entertainment's entertainer's image. They want us all to have an actress by our name. Do you agree or disagree with that? I disagree. I think that um, I think that there's a heightened scrutiny for black people in public. There just is. Um, but I'm always reluctant to ignore human agency as well, right? Like, Bill Cosby's legacy would not be tainted if he hadn't allegedly assaulted so many women. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't want to leave that part out. Now, as far as people holding on to their legacy, Prince held on to his. Muhammad Ali. Well- well, I mean, not exactly. I mean, because he died of a drug overdose. Right, but I mean, that's not the media. I mean, that's how he died. I mean, should we should we just pretend he didn't? Should we pretend he died of old age? I mean, like, he died of an OD, but but we're not we're not tainting his legacy. People love Prince. I love Prince. We all love Prince, and no one is holding that against him. Muhammad Ali passed away. He didn't leave with his legacy intact. Muhammad Ali left with his legacy intact. That's yeah. true. I mean, so I'm 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 not willing to say that people can't leave with their legacy intact. I I agree with Eddie that we tend to demonize black celebrities more, that we tend to attack them more. But Bill Russell's leaving with his legacy intact. Harry Belafonte's leaving with his legacy intact. Sidney Poitier's leaving with his legacy intact. He was in the same movies as Bill. He just didn't rape nobody. <laughs> so I'm willing, to, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to say that we do have some agency here. At the same time, that we have to be hyper aware of how Hollywood absolutely comes for us all the time. Well, you know, one of the, the regular guests on, on Vlad TV is Laura Jamar. And mm. one of the things that we initially discussed that we kind of kept discussing over the years was he felt that America is inherently scared of black men. So when, when you see sort of a, a feminization of the black male, you know, you see like the Kanye with the skirts or you see certain male actors wearing drag, you know, and, and so forth, that this is white society trying to feel more comfortable with, with their fear of black men. I mean, do you agree or disagree with that? I disagree. I, th- I think that, um, I do, th- so there's two pieces to that, right? The first piece is the idea that America is fundamentally or inherently scared of black male bodies. I would say yes, mm-hmm. right? Since slavery, right? The idea of black male is dangerous. Black male is a sexual predator. Yeah. Black male is- Right, right. Like, like for example, like I interviewed Lil Boosie recently, right? Mm-hmm. And we talked about you know, he's from Baton Rouge, and we just talked about a lot of the stuff that was happening over there. And he said, look. Arrests with black people and white people are different. I don't care what people say. 
You know, it's different. You know, the way they the way they approach the car is different. You know, you a, a, a white person is gonna approach the car for teenage white girls differently than approaching the car for teenage for teenage black boys with dreads in their head. True. There's an inherent fear of black bodies. It's not just male bodies, it's also female bodies. Black women are also criminalized and stigmatized in public. So we don't ever want to make this just about black men. Black women are also mistreated by law enforcement. They're viewed as dangerous by the state. They're viewed as criminal. They're viewed as hypersexual. They're viewed as diseased. They're viewed, I mean, all the same things that happen with black men happen with black women, just sometimes by different means. I agree with that. But the idea of saying that men are being emasculated or effeminized, I think, plays into some very dangerous patriarchal and homophobic narratives um, about man masculinity. Like Kanye in a kilt, I believe it was, right? I think it's dope. I think um, Young Thug is dope. Uh, so so you, you think Young Thug wearing a dress is dope? Yeah. Yeah? Why? Because that's who he wants to be. Okay. That's his gender performance. It's not my gender performance. It's his. Well, but, but, but he says he's not gay. And he might not be. If he says, uh, it, it's not up for me to decide his sexual practice, his sexual desire, his sexual ethic. I don't, I'm not interested, right? But I think there are different ways to perform masculinity. And you can perform masculine. I mean, Prince bent gender in very interesting ways, mm -hmm. right? From his hair to his boots to the color purple. Well, I mean, to wearing pants with his ass hanging out. Right. I mean, if, you really, if you really want to go there. Right, but that's what I'm saying. And I'm like, right. okay, that's, that's his gender performance. But Prince still identified as heterosexual. But if somebody wanted to come on the scene tomorrow who had a, a, a gender performance that was complicated and also was same gender loving, that's cool too. I don't care. It's, in, it's interesting that the stakes are so high for men like that, but when female MCs come out, Dressed like dudes, when, there's no moral panic. There's no outrage when, when hard body female MCs come out spitting with flannel shirts on back in the 90s or, or the hair and, 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 and cornrows. We just say, oh, that's so and so. They rap like that. And we accept them how they are, how they want to perform gender, well, how they want to perform gender. But there's a certain desire. level of acceptance of female sexu uh, homosexuality as opposed to male homosexuality on both sides of the coin. Right. And, that, and that, that's all about male patriarchal fantasy, right? Men, want, men, men will allow for certain types of, of female, female, woman, woman sexual desire because in, in our minds it still plays into our own erotic fantasy. Like maybe I could jump in, right? right. So, so if they're femme, we're cool. If they're butch, we start getting, we start getting anxious because it's like, oh, wait a minute. That ain't, that, that, that's too much like dudes, right? It's our own masculine anxiety. It's our own homophobia that we have to police. I don't care if a dude wears a dress. I don't care if a dude wants to bend his gender. I don't care if a dude wants to perform masculinity or manhood in ways that we don't normally uh, accept or are used to. I think it's all good. Be who you want to be. Love who you want to love. Perform the way you want to perform. And I don't see it as a crisis at all. Okay. You have kids? Yes. Okay. Uh, boys, girls? One girl. One girl. That's it. Mm hmm Okay. Now, if you had a boy, you know, would you care if the boy ended up being gay or straight? Would, it, would that no. at all? Not even a little bit. You? Not even a little bit? Not even a little bit. Very progressive. I mean, maybe, you know, people have desire. And if his desire is the same gender, then what am I going to do? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think to me, right now, society is a little bit hypocritical. Because you have people like Caitlyn Jenner, which have their own TV show. Like, you know, she got Woman of the Year, you know, by, uh, was it the, the ESPYs, I think? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so forth, and everyone is so, oh, it's great, and so forth, but if you ask any parent, I mean, any, any parent that I've talked to, and I've asked, would you prefer for your child to be transgender? Everyone said no. You know, they said they'll still love them if they are, but if you really are into equal rights, then you would prefer someone to be transgender or gay as much as they are to be straight. So I feel it's a little bit hypocritical. Well, I, here's what I think. And, and I, I actually, again, if, if, if I had a child who was trans, I'd be fine with that too. Um, I think... But, but would you prefer it? Like if your daughter became trans, if she said, Dad, I want to be a man, I want to take male hormones, I want to get a, a sex change and so forth, would you promote it? Because if you really are 100% for it, you, you would say, great, let's do it. I would say, great, let's do it. Okay. Yeah. 
prefer is a different thing because prefer means you're putting one over the other. What I'm saying is I have no preference. They can do any whatever they are. I want them to be. Mm-hmm. I don't prefer them to be boys or girls. I don't prefer them to be gay or straight. I don't prefer them to be trans or cis. I want them to be who they are. I think some parents are worried about the safety of their child, right? We live in a world that's deeply homophobic or transphobic. And so I prefer um, my child to be safe. And so some parents think that the way for their child to be safe is to not be those things that render them more unsafe. Um, It's not that they don't like trans folk. They just know the kind of life they're going to have to be born into. That's an argument I hear from many parents. Um, But I don't, I, I think less about the safety piece at that level. And I think more about wanting my child to be happy. And if my child is, is lesbian, that's fine. If my child is trans, that's fine. I really don't care. I just want to love my child and, and make sure that they're okay. In 2012, you created a list of overrated white people. <laughs> yes. And Donald Trump was on that list. He was. I, I'm a visionary. <laughs> Why did you feel in 2012 that, that Donald Trump was an overrated white person? Um, his wealth is overstated. His shows are not as, sol- not as solid as we want. His rags to riches tale is undermined by the fact that he got a shitload of money from his father. You know what I mean? People say, oh, it's a million or two. Yeah, a couple million in the 70s is a lot of money to start a business. Uh, yeah, but not, not, I mean, but a million does not, will not get you a hundred million. You know what I'm saying? You have no to be doubt about it. To- no doubt you about it. You have to be very, very smart to turn a million into a hundred million. Right, and I'm saying one, to I don't turn think... A, turning a million to 1.5 into two is really not that hard. Right. You know, over, over time. But you can just live one, and do that. Right, no, no, no. One, I'm saying it wasn't a million. I'm just using an arbitrary number. But, yeah. but, but I think the amount of resources he had in addition to the money, advice, advisors, support, inside deals, access, is different than if... You know, a homeboy down the street got a you know ten million dollars or twenty million dollars. Again, I'm not taking anything away from his business acumen. I'm not saying he, he has no talent. I'm not saying I don't. It's like when, it's like when people sit on the end, the end of an NBA bench and they're like, "Oh, that guy can't play." No, that motherfucker can play. He can play better than everybody in the world except the eleven people in front of him. You know what I mean? Right. And Donald Trump is is a boss. I'm I'm not taking anything away from him. I, I remember I didn't say he's not talented. I'm saying he's overrated. Um, okay. and that comes everything down to his later on. It was his birtherism. You know, questioning the president's birth. I mean, all of it you know, shifted his narrative from just this New York Democrat who's, who's a little bit of a dick on TV to somebody who's really dangerous for America, but we didn't, we, America didn't see it yet. They didn't see that he was positioning himself to do exactly what he's doing now, and I think I saw that, and that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you the one thing that sort of creeps me out about Donald Trump was, I, I don't know if you, if you saw this clip, but during the, the Republican uh, National Convention, when his daughter was you know, did her speech Yeah, he was leaving. The way he sort of touched her seemed a bit inappropriate. Do you, know, do you know what I'm talking about? People have talked about it. I haven't seen it. I have no comment. You haven't seen it. And, and there, was a, there was an interview where Trump said that if, his, if that, that wasn't his daughter, she'd be someone he would date. Right. And, and I, it's, it, it's, it, it's it, kind of it, it, like the ickiness. It cre- like, I'll, I'll it, say that comment. And, and, you, and you have a daughter. Would you ever say that about your no. daughter? I can't imagine saying that. I can't imagine feeling like that. I, I, I'd like to think that there was nothing more to it than just a really awkward sentence structure. Um, I don't have any opinion on it other than to say that it, it was an odd comment and it, it made people uncomfortable. Hmm. I mean, do you feel that, that Trump really could be a dangerous president? I mean, it, it was really gotten to the point where... Yeah. Remember, remember the whole 50 GOP thing? Like all the... You know, there was like 50... Uh, Republican security advisors from yep. various presidents leading back to Nixon, they've all came together and wrote a letter saying that Donald Trump is, is going to, you know, could potentially be the most dangerous president of all time when it comes to foreign policy. Like he has no idea how it works at all. Well, he, he, that would be a very, that's a very high bar because we've had some pretty dangerous presidents when it comes to foreign policy. If you're, right. if you're sitting in Iraq right now, if you're sitting in Afghanistan right now, if you're in Libya right now, if you're in Sudan right now, uh, you might be like, I don't know, Trump got a, he got a lot to beat, you know. But um, of course he's dangerous. I mean, his worldview, to the extent that he has one, and I don't really think Trump has much of a worldview, um, is a dangerous one. His, his, the things that he said, said about nuclear weapons, the things he said about Muslims, the things he said about Mexicans, um, are not only bizarre, but they're dangerous. I, I think the thing that gives me a little bit of comfort is the idea that his policies are so unworkable and he has such little support from his, po- from his 
from his party that I don't worry about a wall going up in Mexico or a ban on Muslims as a practical matter. Um, but Trump is dangerous. I've never said otherwise. But the thing we can't ever forget is that Hillary Clinton's foreign policy is dangerous. Barack Obama's foreign policy was dangerous. And I don't want us to ever move into the space of comfort where we feel like, woo, we got rid of that Trump, we good. No, we got rid of Trump, but we still got a lot of work to do under Clinton to make sure that we have a safe world, to make sure we have a just world, to make sure that we have the kind of distributions of resources and the kind of uh, peacemaking processes, the type of diplomacy that we need around the world and, and, and uh, domestically. Well, I mean, I had a conversation with Praz off camera about, about Trump. And, and his main worry was not so much Trump. He was worried about the person who's going to be running after Trump who's actually going to take a look at the type of buttons that Trump managed to push successfully and basically come with a rhetoric that's not so over the top. But similar in, in print. But, but similar, but just a lot more refined. I ain't worried about that. No? No. Um, one, I think a Trump victory is, is, is not particularly likely at this moment, given everything we've seen, just given looking at the electoral map. Yeah. But I think that... Similar to Obama, right? We had an Obama and we went to the other extreme. I think it's more likely that post... Uh, Obama, we went to the other extreme? Explain. No, I'm saying we had a President Obama, and if yeah. Trump were to be elected, that would be the other extreme. Okay. We had an articulate, principled, uh, mild-mannered, well-educated, smart, disciplined uh, family man, right? And now we got Donald Trump. <laughs> right. I would imagine that the pendulum would swing back the other way. Because before Obama was George W. Bush, right? The cowboy. The guy you'd have a beer with. The guy who found right. pride in mispronouncing words. Right? <laughs> so it, it's an interesting kind of balance, right, that we go back and forth with. So I, I'm less worried about there being a kinder, softer fascist after Donald Trump. <laughs> Although I think it's an interesting question, um, which is what is resonating among the people? Uh, that makes Trump an attractive candidate knowing that he doesn't know anything. Because, I mean, at this point, we all kind of know he doesn't know anything. We just don't, some of us just don't care. It's a, it's a, tough, uh, it's a tough moment, you know? Yeah. Um, because we have a set of political options that are far from ideal. We have a public that is hungry for the drama of the horse race, but I'm not sure has the kind of appetite for justice that I'd want them to have. But the one thing Donald Trump has done for me, uh, I think, is he's made it clear to the world who doubted us that there's still a big section of America that is racist, that is xenophobic. Yeah. You know, and now they used to hide in the supermarket. You'd be shopping with them. You ain't know it. They used to be in your classrooms if you were a teacher. Or they used to be in the pulpit with you or in the pews with you if you went to church. And now... We smoked them out, and they put little red and yellow hats on, you know? And the one thing that worries me, because I got into a conversation with a friend of mine who's like a Washington, D.C. insider, and I asked him if he thinks that Trump will win, and he says, he, he told me maybe, and the reason was this. He said that when you look at the people who are behind Hillary Clinton, they're, you know, if they're going to vote for Hillary Clinton, they will go vote for Hillary Clinton. When you look at the people who are behind Trump, they're not only going to vote for Trump, but they're going to get 10 of their friends. There's definitely a, an excitement over Trump that Hillary does not have right now. That's true. The problem is that person who likes Trump that much probably doesn't have 10 friends. <laughs> I mean, just electorally, if you look at the numbers, I mean, it, it just ain't enough of them. It just ain't enough of them. And the states where they do have 10 friends and their friends got 10 friends are Georgia and Mississippi and Texas. And they'll, But the problem is, in the places that are contested, those four or five states is gonna come down to, there's just not enough of those people right now. Now, there's still plenty of time left. Hillary Clinton could stumble. There could be a scandal. We could have a, t a, a series of terror attacks, God forbid, you know, that, that change people's disposition. I mean, there's, there are things that could happen that could put us somewhere else. But uh, as of now, I think, you know, we, we may be seeing a Clinton administration again. And I just hope again that all the viewers, every, all the voters, all the students, all the elderly, everybody 
is prepared to engage and challenge and reshape this world no matter who's president. We got work to do. You don't see too many uh, PhDs tatted up where <laughs> you are. What, what do the tats represent? What exactly are they? Uh, there's so many, man. Uh, uh, the ones you can see, I'll tell you about. Um, uh, this is a rest in peace that I got in 01, for, just for friends on my wrist, for people. I had a couple, uh, uh, I've had lots of friends die, but a few died in front of me. Um, and it, it was pretty devastating. And um, so I, I, I got, um, I got, uh, I got that tat. This was, this one says, hasta la victoria siempre venceremos. I got this in honor of the Cuban revolution. And it, it, it was talking about really how important, uh, you know, freedom fighting has been to me across the globe. I got these Adinkra symbols. These are uh, from the, from the Akan and, and uh, they mean different things. This one is a Sankofa bird, which means uh, it is never taboo to go back and fetch that which has been left behind. It's really about recognizing history and tradition. This one is uh, a love never gets lost on its way home. This was a love tattoo. Uh, this is a Palestinian freedom fighter who's uh, wearing kufeya, who's holding up the two hands for Al Nasr or the victory. Um, and these are my, my hip hop tapes. Uh, at the top, of course, is Nas' is Illmatic, greatest album ever made. But you got Criminal Minded here. You got Tribe Called Quest, People Instinct of Travels. You got Eric B and Rakim paid in full. You got Outkast, AT Aliens. You got Notorious B.I.G. Ready to Die. You got Fuji's The Score. You got my Power 99 mixtape. Anybody in Philly know what that was about. And then you got Common One Day to All. I mean, uh, like Water for Chocolate. And these aren't the, the, the best albums of all time. These were the tapes that mattered to me and, and affected me in a certain kind of way. Um, I got Black Star Line from, in honor of Marcus Garvey and, and, and the movement. I got uh, Asada Shakur right here. Got uh, a crown from when I was in uh, the, the Holy Tab movement. And I got... Uh, Malcolm X up here.